Hi, this is Patrick Scott. Welcome back to PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. We're going to be continuing our discussion of the introductory material found in Chapter 1. And again, we're going to be covering specifically uh, more discussion, we're talking about democracy, different forms of democracy, and also discussion of uh, various political ideologies. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out to you is, is we're talking about the fact that, you know, we're, in our last discussion we were talking about why we have a representative democracy over a direct democracy, why we prefer that over direct democracy. Um, that leads us naturally into a discussion of, as, in terms of what are the conditions that are required or necessary for a representative democracy to exist. In other words, if we're forming a new country and we're going to have it founded on democracy, and this could again be a direct democracy or a representative democracy, but we can just apply it right now to representative democracy. Um, what kinds of elements or conditions are necessary have to be in place in order for this democracy to thrive? So let's think about that. All right, I want you to think about this as well. What kinds of ways we do about some th things, what about some of the rules that we have in place are going to be required if we're going to have a successful experience at representative democracy. Okay, what do we need? Well, I think first of all we need some basic freedoms, right? We need some freedoms to, you know, uh, to, to choose our leaders, right? We need some basic freedoms to, to decide how the leaders are going to be chosen. We need some basic freedoms in terms of freedoms of speech, freedom of the press, okay, so that the voters can learn about what their representatives are doing and be able to communicate their preferences to them. All right? We want to have the freedom to organize if we want to create a political party. Uh, we need to have the, the ability to organize and not be, you know, not, not be prevented from doing so. We need to have fair access to political resources. In other words, just the idea of being able to have the, the, the ability to influence um, the, the press or the media. Um, but being able to have uh, you know, some, some of the ways in which we can get our message out if we're going to form a political party and try to get voters to vote for our party and for our representatives, we've got to have fair access uh, to uh, these kinds of resources. And of course, one of the most important things is we have to have a respect for the rights and the opinions of others uh, with whom we disagree. So what that basically means is that when we have an election, winners can assume office and the losers are not punished or banned or even killed. And as you know, in a lot of countries, I mean, people fear for their life. If the party that they're part of does not win the election, they have to run and hide in some cases because they fear for their lives. Okay, again, that's a very important, you know, the idea of having respect for the rights and the opinions of others. And along those same lines, there has to be a fundamental belief in the legitimacy of our political system. In other words, people will obey the laws. There has to be a basic belief in the rules of the game that the laws are, 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 are created, that people will obey those laws, that the rulers are going to be answerable to the people. Okay? These are some of the ideas about the uh, basic you know, respect for the basic rules of the game. Now, when we were talking in, during our first segment, we were talking about representative democracy and, and the different kinds of representative democracy. Uh, I allude to the idea that, that there are two basic forms of representative democracy, a parliamentary system and a presidential system. And again, I want to make sure that we have a good understanding of those two. Uh, again, the parliamentary system is common to all European democracies. And again, that's where the people elect the legislature, as you may recall, and the legislature chooses the prime minister, the chief executive. And the, and the key here is so long as the prime minister has the support of the majority of the members of parliament, he or she can pretty much carry out whatever policies they want. Because after all, the policies that they want and believe in will be the same policies pretty much as the policies of the majority in the parliament, and certainly the majority party controlling the parliament. Uh, the prime minister and his, leadership, his or her leadership team, that is the heads of the various administrative departments, uh, what we would call a cabinet here in the United States, the prime minister and the cabinet um, make all the important decisions and the various administrative agencies, what we call the bureaucracy, works for the prime minister. And so the cabinet ministers are actually part of the parliament 
okay? And so there's very little independent authority of the bureaucracy. So in a lot of ways, you've got the bureaucracy and the prime minister and the legislature all working sort of in lockstep together. All right, it's very, very different than what we have here in the United States. And then also, the courts will rarely interfere in a parliamentary system. Uh, so the idea here is that the government should be make decisions and be held accountable to the voters at the next election. If you don't like the decisions that are being made, if you don't like the way the policies are being implemented by the majority par par party and the prime minister and the cabinet and the bureaucracy, as they're all kind of marching together, then you can vote them out of, out of office. But you see in a lot of ways how that's a very efficiently designed system. Because once the decisions are made, people will get behind those decisions and carry them out. Now, in a presidential system is what we have here. We deliberately uh, separated the chief executive from the legislature. There are separately elected branches, and as we alluded to in the first segment, uh, that basically means that um, the party controlling the presidency or the executive can be different from the party controlling the legislature. Uh, in our system, Congress does not pick the president, but the people do. And so the president, in the, under our system, may basically mean this. It's a much less efficient, in fact, much more inefficient system. But the president may propose legislation and have a colleague introduce that legislation into Congress, but there is no guarantee that the Congress will act on it. Or even if the Congress does act on it, it may actually come out in a very different form and have very fundamentally different provisions attached to it than the way the president even envisioned or wanted on that. Okay? So, um, and, and, and vice versa, the, 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 le the legislature, in this case the Congress, could propose legislation, and act on legislation, and then it requires the president to sign that, that legislation into law to make it law, and the president may disagree with it and say, we're not going to do this. Okay? So there is no guarantee that the president will approve that legislation by signing it into law. And in this case here, the bureaucracy, even though the bureaucracy is part of the um, executive branch headed up by the president, in many cases the bureaucracy works for both the president and the Congress. When we talk about bureaucracy, we'll talk about the why idea is that is this any way to run a government? Because on the one hand, you've got a, a whole lot of administrative agencies, the Department of State, the Department of Defense, the Department of Labor, all of these agencies that on the one hand are funded by Congress, but they take their marching orders directly from the president. And if you ever had two bosses, you know how sometimes that can be very, very frustrating. So the bureaucracy, the point here is the bureaucracy does not always carry out consistently the wishes of the president or the wishes of the Congress. And sometimes bureaucracy will play the president and Congress off against each other. So again, that's very unlike what you'll see in a parliamentary system. Here in the United States, it's much harder to get things passed. And I hope you understand, it's also much harder to get things done even once the laws are passed. So once the laws are passed, they're, they're, they're handed off to bureaucracy to implement. And even then, there's no guarantee that, bu that the bureaucracy, these different administrative agencies and departments, are going to carry out the intent of Congress or the President in the way that they envisioned. So again, the point here is that it's much harder in our system to get things done. Um, every, more people really in a lot of ways become involved in the formation of policy and therefore it becomes more difficult to he hold any one specific group or person accountable for the results and there's compromise at every step of the way. Okay, so again, I just want you to understand that there's a, our system of democracy is very, very different from uh, a presidential system, from a, from a parliamentary system. Now, it's probably a good idea to talk about, since, we, since we're talking about government and we're talking about politics, it's probably not a bad idea to make sure that we understand the distinction between government and politics. What is the difference between government and politics? A lot of people equate government with politics, but we ought to make some distinctions here at the outset. So, here's what we should say about government. Government essentially comprises those institutions and officials whose purpose it is to write and enact laws and to execute and enforce public policy. So you're seeing that government basically is involving people and institutions. Politics, by contrast, is referring to processes. Politics refers to those activities aimed at influencing or controlling government for the purpose of formulating or guiding 
public policy. So it's the notion of actually the process or activities in place that's designed to influence public policy. Now, as part of the introductory material, we should also talk about you know, some, some other questions that relate to democracy. And that is this, if you're forming a brand new country, no matter where you are the world over, you've got to basically address three fundamental questions. The first question you've got to address if you're forming a brand new country, who should be in charge? Who should govern? All right. In other words, this is where democracy comes into play. Should we have a democracy? Yes or no? If we do have a democracy, should it be a direct or representative democracy? All right. If we say representative democracy, then we should say what kind of representative democracy? Should it be a parliamentary democracy or based upon a parliamentary system? Or should it be a, one that's based upon a presidential system of representative democracy? All right. If it's not a democracy, what other kinds of government are out there? Should we have a monarchy where a king or a queen rule? Should we have a military dictatorship, perhaps? What about the church? Should we have a theocracy where church leaders, where there is no separation between church and state, where the church is on top and basically governs and dictates what the state can or cannot do, you see? But no matter what type of government system you're going to put in place, one of the first things you've got to figure out is who should govern. Now, in the process of figuring that out, a related question here is this. Where should government authority be vested? Or another way of putting that, where should government authority be located? Where should the major locus of control of government be, be, be uh, located here? Should, and, and to show you here as in our system, should most of the power of government reside at the local level, at the state level, or at the federal level? How much power should the federal government have, the national government, or the states? If we're in another country, it might be how much power should the national government have versus the provinces, the regional government, governments, right? But basically, what we're saying is how much power should each have, and related to that is which level of government should be responsible for what functions? What level of government should be primarily responsible for education? What level of government should be primarily responsible for our defense or our national security? What level of government should be responsible for conducting foreign, foreign policy, for combating crime, for solving problems of pollution and, environment and, and, and other issues relating to the environment? Um, these are the kinds of questions that we'll, we'll talk about in more detail in terms of our chapter on federalism here. But um, again, these get, gets into the idea of separation of powers as well as federalism. Now, as an example of this, would it make sense for the national government to run your town's fire department? Or who should be responsible for collecting your town's garbage? Or running your town's parks? Or hiring your school district's teachers and principals? Okay? Now, many people trust local governments to do these kinds of, uh, deal with these very important kinds of issues. Uh, but uh, there is no way that towns or cities could deal effectively with conducting foreign policy or international trade or national defense or regional issues such as regional unemployment and other major economic or social issues. Okay? But again, that's a very important issue in terms of where should government authority be vested, how much relative power should reside at the different levels of government, and which levels of government should be, <coughs> excuse me, should be responsible for carrying out these very different but nonetheless important functions. And then a third question, and this gets into our discussion of political ideologies, and that is this, how much should government do? Um, should government be involved in doing a lot in our society or doing very little in our society? Should it have a very, very limited role or a very, very powerful role? And depending upon your view, that's, that's a reflection of your political ideology. Um, an ideology is basically, just to make sure we understand this, this is a conceptual tool that we use to think about whether government is doing what it should be doing and uh, perhaps what it ought not to be doing. All right? This is the idea of how, how we conceptualize uh, the, the purposes of government. Now, there are several different types of ideologies that are out there, and we're going to talk about f really five of the basic ideologies. Two of them kind of overlap with each other. And I'm going to give you two different frameworks because different researchers look at these in somewhat different ways, and they're both useful to look at. But um, a traditional conception 
of, of, ideolo of looking at or framework of ideologies has four different ideologies at play, all right? These are liberalism, conservatism, uh, libertarianism, and populism, okay? And let's talk about the differences between these two because you can look at these in terms of should there be, an, how much of a role should government play in terms of the economy and in terms of matters involving your personal life. So this is one framework that sort of looks at those two dimensions. How active should government be in the economy and in matters of your personal life? Now, in terms of liberalism, according to this traditional conception, the government should play an active role in the economy, and that is in terms of regulating business, in terms of making sure that there's, there's adequate competition in the marketplace, all right, in terms of regulating the workplace to make sure that uh, companies protect the health and safety of workers, in terms of stopping pollution. These are all examples of, of an active role of the government in the economy. You want to stop people who, you know, stop polluters, find um, polluters if they are polluting, and you have, create stringent environmental regulations to protect the health and safety. And in fact, if you think about health and safety as, as the two important goals, that justify a government intervention in the economy, that will help you understand what we mean by an active government involvement. Any cases where you see the need to protect the health and safety of people, then that would justify a need for uh, government involvement in the economy. Should the government regulate the stock market? Should the government be involved in, in making sure that banks operate appropriately and have lots of control so, so they don't end up making decisions that may hurt your savings. These are the kinds of different ways in which we see an active government involvement. So <clears throat> according to a liberal conception, if you are a liberal, you would believe that the government should play an active role in the economy, but government should not play an active role when it comes to matters involving your own personal life. Okay, in other words, you ought to have the freedom to do what you want to do. So, it's okay, according to a liberal, to restrict the amount of air pollution. The government should play a, a, an active role in restricting the amount of pollution that's, that's out that, you know, in, in, our, in our state or country, um, and that uh, it, it should go after industries that are heavy polluters, okay? But, on the other hand, government should not be able to regulate the choice to keep your, your if, you, if you're pregnant, the choice to terminate your pregnancy or not. And so uh, that's the idea of not being involved in matters pertaining to your own personal life. Now, taking the same framework about an active role in government versus society, conservatives actually believe the opposite. Government should not play an active role in regulating the economy because that hurts our economy. That puts a fundamental drag on our economy. So let government play an active role in legislating or regulating morality all right, pass laws that provide penalties for the possession and distribution of drugs or nar nar narcotics. But government should not get involved in the economy. There ought to be a hands-off, laissez-faire role. Let it be the invisible hand of the market. The government that gets too involved in the economy will hurt the economy and drag it down, okay? Now, libertarians believe that government should not play a role, much of a role in either sector. The government should basically play a hands-off role in regula regulating the economy and also have a very, very limited role of government in terms of regulating your private life. The, the best government is a government that governs least. This is a libertarian argument. You basically want you know, government to provide basic services such as maybe defense and, and infrastructure such as roads and, and uh, schools, but very, very, very limited role of government beyond that. And then the opposite of, of libertarians are populists. Populists favor government intervention in both the economy and in regulating our personal lives. Okay? Now that's one framework <clears throat> by which you can consider these ideologies. And all you're doing here is basically talking about an active government role or not an active role or reduced government role in terms of the economy and your private lives. Now, that's not a bad way of looking at these four ideologies, but since that, the, that framework was created, there have actually been some better, I think some better ways of looking at it too, and I want to give you a different framework or a different conception of political ideologies to help you, again, understand the nuances a little bit better too, okay? Now, in this case here, this, this is the idea under this, uh, another framework. It looks at, at democracy as being tied to opposing philosophies 
that placed different values on three fundamental, um, di di different emphasis on three fundamental values, all right? And that is freedom, order, and equality, all right? Now I'm going to put this up on a graphic here. But you see basically the, the notion of freedom, order, and equality. These are all fundamental values of our democracy, all right? These are three fundamental purposes of government, to promote our freedom, to preserve order, and to promote equality. And that third one's a more recent conception of government, but it has a lot of implications in terms of what government does. So let's look at that one, the first fundamental purpose of government, and that is to maintain order. If we look at going back to, for example, the writings of Thomas Hobbes, uh, a, a British philosopher, said that one of the most important functions of government is to preserve order. The role of government is to make sure that uh, people you know, have, have some minimal protections. Without government, you're living in a brutish state of nature in which the strong trample upon the weak. So government, and it is a limited government, is there as a means of guaranteeing your survival. All right? And if you have to give up some freedom in the process, it's a small price to pay, but it's to promote order. Now, a second purpose of government is to guarantee the pursuit of individual liberty. This is the freedom to pursue your own goals and happiness. All right? And again, that's reflected very, very heavily in terms of our Constitution and in the thinking of our founding fathers who are guiding about this notion of individual freedom and liberty. And then a third purpose, and that's the promotion of economic and social equality. And here, the idea is that government is playing a role in terms of helping those who are less fortunate. All right? It may mean providing things like medical care, public assistance, educational opportunities, housing, and those kinds of things to help ensure that uh, there's the, the disparities between the haves and have-nots are reduced uh, to, to at least some degree. Now, if you think about these values of democracy, it's important to understand that to achieve one objective often comes at a trade-off with the other. All right, now let me give, give you an example. In your mind, which is better? Should we live under a government that allows individuals complete freedom to do whatever they please or to live under a government that enforces strict law and order? In this case, you see a, a trade-off between freedom versus order. Which is better, to allow businesses and private clubs to choose their own customers and members, such as a private country club, or should we pass laws that require them to admit and serve everyone regardless of their race and gender. And again, this is a case of a trade-off between freedom versus equality. Now from these trade-offs, we see four basic ideologies. Okay, as you see from the graphic here, and based upon these, we have libertarians, liberals, conservatives, and communitarians. And communitarians replace the notion of populists that we talked about earlier. Now, Looking at this graphic here, you can see, I want you to make sure you understand how to interpret this graphic. Conservatives can, uh, care most about order, the preservation of a moral order in society, and they are in favor of laws that help to ensure a moral order in our society, that, that protect us from our enemies, but at the same time that, that help to ensure some type of a moral order. Um, conservatives, as you see from looking at that graphic, value order more than freedom, see? And they also value order more than equality. And you see the equality is almost the exact opposite of order. So conservatives would value order more than freedom and value freedom more than equality. But they prefer order more than anything else. Now look at liberals. Liberals favor what? Equality. They favor government intervention, not only in the economy, but also to enhance social equality. That's why I put it, this, think this is, in a lot of ways, a better type of conception because it's not just regulating the economy, but it's also promoting social equality. That's why it's good to have two different frameworks here. Liberals value equality more than freedom, right? And they value freedom more than order. They have the greatest distaste for order because it's the far, furthest away from their position. Now, look at libertarians. They value freedom more than anything else, right? They have an equal distaste for government programs and policies that promote order or that ensure promote equality in our society. They're all about preservation of freedom. And then the last one here is the communitarians. And the communitarians basically value 
equality and order equally, and they value the, the promotion of equality and order more than freedom, all right, more than, and they're willing to make that trade-off. So they are in a lot of ways the opposite of the libertarians. Communitarians believe in an active government role in our society in promoting uh, and, and regulating our economy, but also in terms of promoting social, social equality as well, as well as promoting a, a, a moral order in, in our society, okay? So those are some of the, 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 the basic differences under this particular conception. Now, the reason why I also bring this up is I want you to understand something. And uh, by the way, the Blackboard website has a, a, uh, uh, a resource that you can go to to uh, assess your own political ideology. And I want you to go to that and, and, and click on the links and take that test to see what your own political ideology is. There's a couple of different links that I've got here posted on my Blackboard, and you'll see that under the material for, for the first chapter. But the point here that I want to share with you is this. I want you to keep in mind that it's simplistic to depict liberals or conservatives as wanting government or no government. In a lot of ways, when we start thinking about you know, these ideologies, we often just kind of narrow it down to liberals versus conservatives. And liberals want all a massive you know, government and conservatives want no government. And that's just not true at all. In fact, a better way of looking at this is that both liberals and conservatives favor or oppose government activity depending upon its purpose. So conservatives are quite happy to have an active government and, and lots of programs spending that promote order in our society. A lot of uh, um, uh, uh, conservatives, you know, you, you hear some people, conservatives say, no, 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 we want limited government. But what they're really talking about is they want limited government in terms of the economy. But they're not talking about limited government in terms of promoting morality. They're not talking about they're opposed to laws that regulate morality. And they're talking about uh, uh, policies that reduce our, our defense and our national security. And uh, interestingly, if you hear Republicans talking about, for example, we look at during the uh, George W. Bush administration and, and our engagement with Iraq and our, the massive amount of money being spent in terms of our, uh, supporting our defense while over in Iraq, you know, a lot of Republicans would be, were becoming increasingly um, uh, upset about how much money how, much, how big our government was becoming under the George W. Bush administration, how big our deficits were becoming, how much money we were spending, how, they were, how their deficits were growing. And in a lot of ways, because what these Republicans were doing were reflecting as really more of a libertarian impulse as opposed to a conservative impulse. Um, so on the one hand, if you are a Republican, and if you're on the one hand for uh, a strong national defense and protecting our national security, but at the same time, you're for limited government in terms of limiting our economy. In a lot of ways, what you're doing is you're reflecting both a conservative impulse and a libertarian impulse, you see. But the point here is that you can be a conservative uh, and, and favor big government and, 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 um, and, so, uh, and be a liberal and favor limited government depending upon if it's involved in terms of promoting or, or regulating a moral order in our society. So again, the point is that both conservatives and liberals favor or oppose government activity depending upon its purpose. It's not simply one wanting all government, lots of government, one not wanting, wanting just limited government. Okay, so again, let me remind you, there are a couple of links that I have placed on our course's Blackboard website, and I want you to go and click on these links to test your own political ideology. Okay, now, we're moving, now that goes all back to, you know, again, what kind of government we're gonna have, the purposes of government, you know, who should govern, where should government authority be, be vested, and of course, how much should government do? Now, let me shift gears here and talk a little bit about different models of democracy uh, that you're going to see coming into play in some different ways throughout our course, as we're talking about. Um, primarily, there is this, I, two most important ones are the majoritarian model of democracy, and I want you to talk about that and see, see how it contrasts with a pluralist model of democracy, all right? Now, the majoritarian model basically says that it values participation by the people as a whole in general, okay? In other words, each and every citizen has the same influence over government and government would do what the majority of citizens wanted, all right? Now, that's the majoritarian model. It assumes that people can control government by having adequate mechanism, mechanisms for popular participation 
It assumes that people are knowledgeable about government and politics, that they want to participate in the process, and that they make rational decisions in voting for elected representatives. This is the idea of mass democracy, and you're responding to the public as a, as a whole. And then so you craft public policies. The government basically crafts policies based upon what the majority of people want. That's what they call it, the majoritarian model. And that is a model of democracy clearly at work here in our country. But also I want to give you another model that's not only clearly at work also, but perhaps even more dominant. And that is the pluralist model of democracy. The pluralist model of democracy basically says you participate as a citizen in our system, but not in mass, but instead you participate in groups. You join a group. There are many groups that, in, that, that are, are out there and that, that influence government. These groups compete with each other in trying to influence government. And as part of this idea here then, it suggests on the pluralist model of democracy, it basically suggests that it's only through your participation in groups that government will hear you. All right, now, because uh, what this suggests here is that, um, that people join groups and these groups press their interest upon government. There are many competing groups and government attempts to serve as a broker among these competing interests, all right? And by the way, that what that basically means here is that government policy is often a reflection of these competing groups that are pressing their demands on government. And I'll give you an example of this. This may, may be why, for example, that we have policies that on the one hand try to, uh, let's talk about uh, tobacco, on the one hand encourage the consumption of tobacco and on the other hand discourage the consumption of tobacco. All right, now let's just talk about some examples of that. In what ways does our, if we look at our t tobacco policy, how do we encourage the consumption of tobacco? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Uh, for tobacco subsidies that uh, we give, the Agric Agriculture Department gives to farmers uh, for their economic benefit to grow tobacco, all right? These subsidies that they get uh, are designed to benefit farmers economically, but that encourages the consumption of tobacco. Um, we also provide, the U.S. government also provides tax breaks, corporate tax breaks to companies that promote their products overseas, and that would include tobacco companies. So if Marlboro or Winston and others are uh, promoting their products overseas in the name of export promotion, they, they may be very well eligible for a tax break. So corporate tax breaks designed for promotion of trade, promote exports, are an example of how we are encouraging the consumption of tobacco. Now how do we discourage the consumption of tobacco? Many different ways, right? We have the Surgeon General's warning that says if you smoke the cigarettes you will die. We have, for example, restrictions on the sale of tobacco to anyone under the age of 18. Uh, that's, that's put, put on by, by uh, throughout, throughout governments all across the United States. We have uh, federal requirements in terms of where you can advertise uh, tobacco products. You cannot advertise tobacco products on television. When I was growing up as a kid, they were all over on television advertisements, but the, now they are restricted. They cannot be advertised on, te on television. So in terms of marketing, government restrictions on the marketing of tobacco is a way in which we discourage the consumption of tobacco. The point here is this is a simple example to show uh, how many different groups in our society are pressing their demands at the same time upon government, and government is trying to accommodate all of these interests, they're trying to broker, be a broker among all these competing interests and crafting policy that reflects compromises and, uh, and tries to accommodate all these different interests even though many of them are diametrically opposed to each other. And that's why we have policies sometimes that again that might be somewhat schizophrenic in its approach. And I think tobacco is a good example of that. But again the pluralist model, this is a good example of the pluralist model at work. People are joining these different groups, lots of groups that are out there, and basically what this means is that government is not responding to mass public opinion of the electorate as a whole, but instead is responding to organized groups of citizens. So under this conception of government, to play in the game, you first have to join a group. This is your ticket to play, all right? And interestingly, pluralism demands less knowledge of citizens because only uh, basically only the leaders of these groups, you join the National Rifle Association and, the, and, the, and you give money to this, and then the leaders of these groups are the ones who are become specialized in their knowledge of different pieces of legislation that are being considered in Congress. Um, and in a lot of ways too, uh, minority interest, however you, you conceptualize minority interest, 
uh, minorities have a much better chance of flourishing under this system. All right, so uh, I would make the argument that our system contains elements of both the majoritarian model and the pluralist model, certainly, but in a lot of ways, the pluralist model is the one that dominates. And as we s cover more material throughout our course, you're gonna see uh, some discussion of this coming up in, into play. Now, if, if there's anything, and we'll talk about this in terms of our chapter on interest groups, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the flaws, I think, in pluralist, uh, uh, regarding our pluralist theory is that it tends to provide advantages to those who are wealthy or well-connected politically and economically, while those who are poor or not well-organized are not able to make government as responsive to them. And then some, sometimes um, um, people also discuss this idea of elite theory. Um, I, I don't put too much attention to this, but it's the idea that where government power is in the hands of a few, it's a ruling elite, it's just a few powerful interests control our government. This is the idea about elite theory. Now, it's not that far removed from conceptual pluralism, so I don't really fo focus that much on elite, elite theory that much. Uh, but I think pluralism is actually more of an accurate model uh, to discuss here. So in any, in any case, this, I think this is a good time to wrap up our discussion of the uh, material found in the introductory chapter. We're going to move in the next uh, discussion on and talk about the Constitution. We'll be talking about different provisions of the Constitution, various aspects of the Constitution, how we formed the Constitution the way we did, strengths and weaknesses of our Constitution as well. So this is Patrick Scott. We'll see you next time.